behind the accounts for last year. And the guy in the middle stood up and said, it's not the Bulgarian government's fault. And remember, this is me telling the truth. This is exactly what he said. It's not the Bulgarian government's fault. The Bulgarian government report to the Bulgarian mafia, and they've got the money. <laughs> now, when you receive a reply like that, it's so far off the spectrum that you're thinking, well, what's the next question? Because it's not our civilization. And you don't expect this. I mean, they had billions. They'd had money for roads, hospitals, schools, infrastructure. Because they'd come into the EU. It was the golden hello. Come on, upgrade everything. Have a nice day. And they gave it to the mafia. So uh, after that, the EU had to actually <coughs> oversee projects done in Bulgaria. It's happened before. It happened in Portugal when money went missing for a, mo for a motorway. You know about that? It went missing for a motorway. So after that money into Portugal was overseen more, more extensively. But when you come across answers like that, it makes me want to weep, really, because there's a lot of very poor people in Bulgaria, and they're getting money to be given to the mafia. I'm already angry about Bulgaria, because they have lots of rich people. Mm. And of course, these countries who are now getting your tax money filtered in through the EU could actually tax their own people in their own countries, rich people in Bulgaria, rich people in Portugal. But they don't, because they have an elite to tend to avoid tax. So the British people and the Germans, etc., are milked, <clears throat> so that the money can go to these places that do not have efficient taxation systems, is my view. And it's wrong, because rich people in Bulgaria should be paying more tax. Yeah. And Greece is another Greece, example. Yeah. How many shipping magnets there yeah. don't pay tax? You know, it's nearly as bad as... Some of the multinationals who don't pay tax in the UK and keep it all offshore. These yeah. things need sorting. Yeah. And um, yeah. why should we have to keep paying for all of this stuff when other people are genuinely responsible and morally responsible for paying money into the system and we get caught for it? Yeah, but how can they make them pay tax, people like Google, etc.? How can well, I, I, think, I think you could actually, because obviously I'm not going to start writing a new manifesto on taxation. But you could do have a flat tax policy, and we would attack it on the basis that I think of where the product is sold more than where the accounts are kept, yes. and we would we would probably yes. take it on that basis. And my criteria is: you start with a small business, and you say whatever that product <coughs> small business has to face, everybody else should face. So if big companies come into the UK, they should have to face the same scrutiny and pay the same level of tax. Otherwise, small businesses are going to be put out of business by people who aren't paying the overheads. They're not paying the tax, so they can afford to undercut the small businesses and put them out, which is what has been happening. <coughs> Tell that to the government, because they yeah. take no notice. You know? But I've come up through business, and a lot of these guys who think they know it all, and I don't, but they do, I've never had a proper job, as I say. Let's have some questions, because it can't go on forever. You, well, you, you might find it a bit difficult to answer, but is there any snippet of anything good coming out of this? Yes. If it wasn't for the EU, there would be no UKIP. <laughs> <laughs> Until UKIP came here, the news wasn't out there. We're here. We're not. I wouldn't describe our, as, ourselves as subversive, but perhaps we are, because we come in, we tell the truth about what's happening. Yesterday, I saw the Conservatives voting in favour of stuff which we were voting against. It was control of the British media by the EU. No. Regulations to control the British media no. by the EU. Yeah. If yeah. anybody's going to do that, if anybody can control it, it should be in Westminster that that yeah. legislation yeah. is made, not in the yeah. EU. And we were voting against, and we were appalled because we couldn't believe the Conservatives were voting for all yeah, this nonsense. Yeah. And they're pouring all their energy. And I said to the Conservative next to me, who's actually a nice guy, he's from Ceylon, he's a nice guy, and I said, well, why are you voting for, for this? And he said, oh, I don't think they understand it. Oh. Is actually what he said. 
then they must understand it. They, they've got their assistants to read, read it through. So one more question. Just one more for me. Uh, are you embarrassed that you are, as a group, have been awarded 27% pay rise for next year? I didn't know, I didn't know we had. Have we done a pay rise of 27% next year? I didn't know that. What, me personally, as a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is this if I get elected? Or I just know that. I understand. We aren't here for the money. We are. We are honest. <laughs> I've given what I listen. I've given yeah, more money away I know to UKIP it. initially. Yeah. I have. I was giving money to UK. I gave. I gave sixty thousand pounds for a part of political broadcast, and I gave. This is before as an MEP, and all sorts of other things before and after. I am not here for the money. I'm here because my father was in the RAF during the war. I'm here because three of my uncles had to fight in the desert. I'm here because one was in Air Sea Rescue. I'm here because my wife's father was one of the first at the beach at Salerno. They didn't do that no, so that we can be no, run from here. Absolutely. They did that because we're a free nation and we should govern ourselves from Westminster. And that is really how I feel about it. But also, I've already told you in my business, I was made even more angry by the fact that businesses were closing because of EU regulations, which should be made in Westminster. The post office is a classic case, by the way. Yeah. Please let me tell you about the post office. We voted against EU regulations on the post office, which were no monopoly, so the post office had to be broken up, so you had to introduce foreign competition, like Deutsche Post and, and the and the um, Dutch Mail, and also no subsidies for post offices, which was amended to reducing uh, subsidies for post offices. So the impact in the UK was, oh, and by the way, Conservatives voted for it, Labour did, and the Lib Dems, okay? And we were the only ones against. And our motive was, no, this should be regulated from Westminster, not here. Because some of these people don't even have a post office system. No. If you live in Portugal, if they don't deliver to your door, you have to have a mailbox in the post office, and you have to buy that. So if you don't want tax invoices, don't have a mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Anyway, so anyway, all this rubbish went through, and the next thing you know in the UK is, of course, post offices start closing in rural areas because no subsidies. Yeah. Then the Royal Mail stamp goes up. Why? Because the Royal Mail are only doing the poor bits now. <coughs> Because Deutsche Post has stolen the bits that are profitable, because that's what you do when you privatise things. I'm not not very, right, uh, we're right wing. Oh, we're not right wing of the Conservative Party. I don't believe in all these privatisations. Yeah. I don't even believe in road tolling. Anyway, so so what happened next? I just gonna, what happened next was these things started to close, and we were saying, well, now what are you going to do about it? And my Lib Dem counterpart in the West Midlands was campaigning to open post offices. So I said, what are you doing? You voted to close them in the European <laughs> Parliament, and now you're getting votes on the strength of the fact you're in favour of keeping them open. How does that work? I think you're saying that, no? Yes. <laughs> How does that work? And she said, oh, well, I think this should stay open. And I said, well, I think if we made, we made the rules in Westminster, they wouldn't survive the heat on this one, and they'd have to revise their thoughts because the British would actually vote against it and would at least be able to re we'd we'd be able to change all this legislation. But now it's through this place, you've got to convince 27 other nations, now that Croatia are in, 27 other nations to change their minds. And that verges on the impossible. And that's why Mr Cameron will never succeed in renegotiating anything. No, no, no. Because he's got to talk to 27 other countries, each thinking that they have an input in it many of whom don't have any interest in it. They don't have a postal system. Or, for example, they don't have a City of London producing revenues like ours does, or whatever the regulation is. So the difficulties are manifold, and you can't get over them. But all I know is the power is in the ballot box. And if it was at Westminster, we wouldn't have nonsense coming out, because we get rid of the blighters. <laughs> Can we leave? You, you have to yeah. No, you go to the answer, Mike, because it was about the budgets. And there's one behind you as well. Thank you. From a straight economic point of view, with the Germans being the crutch of Europe at the moment, their growth rate is yeah. very small. Okay. France have gone into recession. Greece, Spain, et al. are draining. Isn't the European Union virtually on its deathbed? It is, but you've said something, and people ought to reflect and look at that argument the other way around and ask why. Why? You've named a load of Eurozone countries there who are struggling under the weight of the Euro, except Germany. 
Now, if Greece had its own currency back, it could devalue it, and we could go on holiday cheaply. They'd all be employed. We'd be happy because we'd have a good deal. But no, you've got the German influence in the Eurozone, and they're the only country who see the Euro as being actually undervalued. So their exports out of the Eurozone are driving higher and higher because they've got a wonderful situation. They've got a, what they consider to be a low-valued <coughs> currency, and they can afford to export to their heart's content out of it. Whereas, if they had the Deutsche Mark back, they have a much worse trading position because their wages and overheads would be on the Deutsche Mark yeah. situation and they would find it more difficult to trade. So, I would say to you that the real answer in the Eurozone is it's not fair because the Euro isn't like the pound. Let's revert to the pound. We have a single currency, it's called the pound. It comes Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, England. And we don't discriminate. We don't say, well, you're Welsh, you can have a different interest rate to we English. But to take this a step further, if the City of London were to be discriminated against, and, uh, against say, uh, Newcastle on Tyne or Liverpool, you can see there are completely different economies there. That the GDP generated in London is tremendous, and that maybe not so high now in Liverpool, or maybe not so high in Newcastle on Tyne. But they don't have different interest rates. They're all on the same currency. So they don't have the disability in Newcastle and Liverpool of having to borrow at higher interest rates. It's all one banking system, one central bank, one taxation system. Whereas in the Eurozone, it's discriminatory. You have different countries trying to borrow at very high interest rates. I'm sorry, but the answer is the Germans, if they want this single currency, have to be fair and they have to share it. So it's got to be one interest rate, and the Germans are going to have to bite the bullet, just like they did when they took on Eastern Germany. And they're going to have to take it on. I say it's one banking system, it's one interest rate. We're really sorry that we've uh, done this to the Greeks. You know? And of course the Greeks are bringing the war up again now, aren't they? They're saying, well, actually the Germans owe us war reparations that they never made. This isn't me, this is, this is what they're saying, isn't it? And then in, 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 also in Greece and in Spain you've got people waving banners saying, this is the Fourth Reich. <laughs> Have you not seen that? That's true. That's, that's not me, again. So they're bringing back all this hatred towards the Germans. And this place is supposed to be for peace. Well, it's causing a lot of aggro. I don't know why not we're not yet. Sorry. If we go back to 700 and odd MEPs, I looked at the league table we saw on the chart, yeah. and I think we're third in the league. There are lots of countries with only six members. Yeah. Is it on population basis? Yes. It is, it is basically on population basis once you get over a, the bottom. There's a minimum number of MEPs oh. you're allocated. I can't remember, I think it's five, you'll find it on there. So places like Malta will get, will get that and so on and so on and so on. And, uh, but so you start with five and then it's when you get to a certain population you get whatever it is in the course of the population. So the Germans have got more than us by a long chalk, and when the Turkish come in, they'll have more than us by a long chalk, and so on and so on. Yeah, it depends on the population size. Any more like that? Do you suffer from blood pressure? <laughs> <laughs> I've got my equipment in my outfit. <laughs> And at 12 o'clock, a little voice comes on my phone. I have to give the numbers, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay, actually. <laughs> my bottom reading never goes to 100, which is the important one, I believe. So, so, yeah, so, so, so I ought to suffer from wood pressure, yeah. <laughs> Probably I do. Any, any more questions? Okay, but I want to leave the EU. How easy is it? Thank you. And <laughs> right, go, right, we signed a stupid piece of paper called the Lisbon Treaty. And of course we had a cast iron guarantee from the Conservative Party that we would have a referendum on that and that cast iron guarantee has been broken. So the little boy that cries wolf cried wolf again and failed to give us what we were asking for. Right, the Lisbon Treaty, upon which we should have had a referendum and didn't, contains an article called Article 50 and it says in there that if we want to leave the EU we have to apply. And to apply we have to... Uh, give them three years notice that we wish to leave and then they behind closed doors excluding us will decide upon the terms which they will impose upon us to leave. Now when this was debated in the chamber I was the one that stood up and said and if we apply to leave and you say we can't leave 
which is effectively what the treaty says, because they can decide <coughs> that we can't leave. If we apply to leave, and you say we can't leave, and we do leave, are you going to send in the tanks? Is what I said. And you can imagine the reaction. It was boo, hiss, and it never happened. Well, in my view, believe me, when you're with a solicitor, you look at, have to look at the worst case scenario when you're signing a bit of paper. And the worst case scenario is you can't get out. And that's what they've signed. They've signed a piece of paper really saying, theoretically, we can't get out. But it breaks our British constitution yeah. because our constitution says one government cannot bind a subsequent government. And that's why UKIP say, if we're elected, I'm sorry, but we're not bound by that. We weren't a party to anything of this sort. And, you know, one government cannot bind a subsequent government on a constitutional issue like who runs the country? In fact, when the Queen was forced to sign that, it broke her coronation oath because she was supposed to keep the British Constitution in place. So it did break her. But she was, on the other hand, the Constitution says that she has to virtually obey her ministers. So if her ministers tell her to do something, she's got a choice then of either breaking the Constitution because she's not going to do what the ministers are telling her to do and she brings down the government and she virtually <coughs> causes a revolution or she doesn't sign the treaty which causes a different kind of revolution so she, in the end she's got to take, I think, the avoidance of doubt on the side of the Queen I think she should, she's done the right thing and she has to do what she's told to do by the government which we have all elected because that's the principle we elected the government, it's not her fault it's our fault. Sorry, that was the answer. Has your party actually sat down and designed a specific manifesto, if you were? <coughs> yes. <a> it's, <laughs> I prefer, at the last general election, we had a manifesto that was bigger than the other three parties' manifestos put together. But the press didn't seem to know it, and the people kept saying we don't have a manifesto. We always did, but it was well downplayed. However, I'd rather not go back there because we're writing a new one anyway. And our transport one, of which I'm involved, will tell you that we don't believe in a third runway at Heathrow. We believe in uh, Marston, uh, Manston Airport, which is Kent International Airport and used to be a base where the bombers used to land in the war if they were on a wing and a prayer. So we want that one. It's as big as Stansted. We think it should be resurrected and brought in because it's half a mile away from a high-speed rail link into London and there's an unemployment situation there. And unlike Heathrow, the people want it locally for employment and the planes come in over the sea anyway so it doesn't go over the city. So there's all these plus points for it. Where's that so coming out, your manifesto? Well, I, I'm hoping that it's going to come It doesn't need to come out until before an election and that's why usually parties don't do it. The Lib Dems don't have a manifesto at the moment. And uh, you know, I don't know what the Labour one is because that, that's in uh, that's in in the right. Do you think it's realistic? Because one of the things we see on television frequently is I would do this or I would do it's very easy to say that, isn't it, when you're you're not having to be responsible. If you did get into government, do you genuinely believe that what you're saying you would do is workable? Well, we're costing it. We're trying to say that. But the point is, most of these things that uh, I would have thought sensible. I mean, if we cancelled HS2, you've already lost £36 billion overnight by doing that. But we say we would then put a third of that back into upgrading the existing rail network by making that faster, by improving the number of carriages, by extending platforms and giving it more flexibility <coughs> rather than spend all that money going through the countryside with new rail tracks mm. to save 15 minutes between Birmingham and London which we, th we, we really think isn't worth the money yeah. because it's not going to be 36 billion it's going to be 100 yeah. billion and, yeah. and rising. So, Can we get back to the EU if we don't mind please? Um, in so much that in 1975 we were given the uh, vote of whether to stay in the EC in those Correct. days. Yeah. Uh, we were misled, yeah. uh, which is tri uh, history has proved. Uh, Cameron has gone on television and announced that in 2017, after negotiations with the EU, that he will hold a referendum. Yes. My biggest fear, and I think many people in this room's biggest fear, is that we will not be told the truth and we will vote on something, a, a hypothetical situation. 
Uh, okay. That worried a lot of right. people. You've touched a nerve to start with because yeah. Edward Heath in the 70s promised the British people, 73, wasn't it? faithfully yeah. promised them that it would not impinge on our sovereignty. We would lose no sovereignty by signing up with this trade agreement with the EU. Well, we subsequently found out it's not a trade agreement, it's a takeover bid. It is actually a union, like the United States and Europe. So he lied, and he knew that, apparently, because he admitted it later. He knew it was a, a, a union of countries, not a trade agreement. But he also lied on sovereignty, because these days, Barroso, who is the, chair, the, yeah, the chairman of the, the, the president of the commission, comes to the parliament, and he said this regularly, and his exact words are, this is the new European empire into which you have all pooled your sovereignty. He says that. And, and we say, but yeah, we haven't pulled ours. We don't believe it. That's not all we voted for. And if we're to pool our sovereignty, we need another vote on it. Now, as for Mr. Cameron, he's in favour of this place. He's offering a referendum only because you give a bite at his heels. It's only three years ago since he, since he said, stop banging on about the EU. He wanted to put it to the bottom of the agenda. And if you speak to these politicians, they say, oh, it's not really on people's minds, Europe. They've always said that. They haven't told you that all the things that are happening to the UK are really Europe, like post offices, but like all the other things that are on the list, immigration and all the other things that people are worried about, directly involved. But, but, oh, Europe's not on people's minds. No, but what he doesn't say, it's all the damage from all these other things that are on your minds that are European, and he's not admitting to it. <coughs> but what he said, he wants to renegotiate, and then he's going to campaign to stay in, basically, because he feels this is the right place for us. And I disagree with him wholeheartedly. I, I used to be a Conservative. In 1966, I was chairman of Colville Young Conservatives. I started there, but I lost faith. In it completely, I would never go back, ever. And we're not all conservatives, you know. In our MEPs, we have, we've got Lib Dems, ex-Lib Dems. We've also got a couple of Labour people who are MP MEPs. For example, John Bufton from Wales, who's an excellent bloke, and he's from the left, but he believes exactly what I believe in. I have no political problem with him at all. Maybe it's because I'm to the left of the Conservative Party, and I even don't understand why we nationalise things like water. I mean, privatise things like water. <coughs> Why have we got an M6 toll road where there's no cars on it? Why isn't it in the system? It was supposed to relieve the M6. That's why it was built. It wasn't built to make a profit out of. It was to stop us having to expand the M6 through Birmingham. And now they have to do that. They spent millions, if not billions, on actually improving the M6 because the toll is privatised and nobody can afford it. It's things like that that we all agree on. We're against tolls.